looking in the second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, it talks about uh, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us <clears throat> cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, read it again. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. When you're born into this earth, you're born a perfect human being. A perfect human being. Whether you have Down syndrome, you're still a human being. Or whether you're a Mensa student, you're still a human being. And you're still perfect, regardless of either case of your mentality. The problem is, is when a child is born, he has the faculties for growing into a healthy adult. He has 10 fingers, toes, and everything else, a brain, a body, but it's got to mature. It's got to come into completion, complete maturity. <clears throat> the Bible talks about perfecting. It's like maturing. Uh, when we are born again, we have the spirit of Christ born in us. And as Christ was born into this world some 2,000 plus years ago, he was born into this world as a babe. When he's born into your heart, he also was born into your heart as a babe, a seed, as it were, the seed of Christ. And when you think about it, once a child is conceived in its mother's womb, that child is a human being. But is it complete? No. Is it... Uh, uh, mature, no. So this is what we are dealing with when we're talking about our spiritual growth. When we are babes in Christ, that means we have not yet grown up into him. We are to be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you hear, do you hear what the Bible says? We are to be filled with all the fullness of God until we come into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The goal in the Christian's life is to have Christ be made manifest in our mortal bodies. What did John the Baptist, who was the greatest man born of woman, the Bible states that uh, there was a certain situation that happened in the Old Testament, and God said that if the three perfect men in Scripture were there, they would only save themselves. Daniel would have saved himself. Noah would have saved himself. Job would have saved themselves. <clears throat> but the greatest man born in scripture was John the Baptist. Jesus Christ said it. He was the greatest man born of woman, except for Christ. Christ was not born of woman. He was born of God. Okay. That's where he makes the distinction. But even John the Baptist, <clears throat> when he was born, he was born a babe. He was in his mother's womb, and he leaped for joy when he heard the, the gospel. But when he came out, he had to learn scripture, and he had to grow. Same with Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the Bible states that they had to carry him to Africa. And then he came back to Jerusalem, to Nazareth, and then to Jerusalem, where he began to confound the people there. And he, be, he had to submit himself unto his parents. And he began to grow in wisdom and knowledge and in favor with God and man. Okay? You kind of wonder, Jesus grew in favor with God and with man? Yes, he grew. He was a seed of Christ. As he grew, he became affecting holiness, getting better, better and better and better. What did he say? He said, I do miracles and I do cures. On the third day, I shall be perfected. Okay? When he was born down here, he wasn't born completely mature. He had to grow. Just like you and I. When we have the spirit of Christ born into our hearts, we have to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. We have got to remember as born again believers, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we're going to be going through tonight in Romans chapter eight. We have the peace with God, but that does not mean that we're mature. That's why the second Corinthians seven one says what? Having the promises of God, dearly beloved, let us and go to perfection by cleansing ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh. Why? Because the flesh does not want to give place to God. The flesh wants to have the place for itself. The flesh wants to take honor to itself, glory to itself, 
uh, privileges to itself. The flesh wants to squeeze out Jesus in the church of Laodicea. What happened in that church? Jesus is on the outside of the church, knocking to get into his own church that he built. Why? They're in there having church. They don't have Jesus. And that's the Laodicean church age, which means the rights of the people. This is the age that we're living in. It's the last church age in the Bible. Of those seven churches, Laodicea was last. Speaking of our situation here, right before the rapture of the church, we're in, right now we're in the Laodicean church age, the rights of the people. The word of God does not have preeminence in the church. People's rights do. You can't speak the word of God boldly in the church. Why? Because you hurt people's feelings. You can't, you, you'll hurt this class of people's feelings. You hurt this class of people's feelings. You'll hurt women's feelings if you tell them what the Bible says about uh, their bodies not being their own. You hurt the men's feelings by telling them what to do. You hurt the gays' feelings. You hurt the sinner's feelings. Everybody's about feelings, rights, rights, rights. No, 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 no. We go back to Galatians chapter 4, verse 30, which states, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? What does the scripture tell us to do? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? Renewing our mind. That means when you're born again, you have Christ in you, that does not mean that he has developed his mind in you. That's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You have to do what? Let it, because what mind is in you? The carnal mind that has been groomed since it was crying when it was born into this earth, the Bible says, speaking lies. The carnal mind that knows how to, does not know how to turn the other cheek. The carnal mind which is self-centered, the carnal mind which is on the throne, the carnal mind which does not take God's word into consideration when it has a problem, the carnal mind, which goes by its experience and not by the word of God, it sets the word of God aside for its own thoughts. Why? Because when even Adam ate of the knowledge of good and evil, that's the religion of the natural man now. I know good. I know evil. I'm just as good as the people at church. I can do this. I can. I don't have to have the Bible. I don't have to have to go to church. I don't have to, I don't have to, because I am so smart. That's why the people are going to hell. What does the Bible state? The world by wisdom knew not God, okay? But if so, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that knew the knowledge of good and evil, stopped <clears throat> doing the evil and began to do the good? No, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that behave? No. None of us behave properly. That's why the Bible says we have to cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and, and spirit by perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord and why do we use it to perfect holiness? What does it mean, perfect holiness? To mature in holiness. When a child is born, a child has little baby arms, little baby feet, little baby this, that, and other, and it has to what? Those things have to mature. We used to have a guy named by the name of Lee Haney he was a African-American who developed his body to become Mr. Olympia. He was a huge guy. He lifted weights. He ate right. And he was a born-again believer. He didn't come out born like that. He had to do what? He had to get down and get into exercises. And the Bible tells us to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Let's look at this. Let me type that in, get this uh, scripture for you. But the Bible tells us we need to, the Bible says bodily exercise profits little. Exercise. But godliness is profitable for all things. Let's see here. Exercise unto godliness. First Timothy 4, 8 says bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is what we need to be exercised. Unto. Turn to 1 Timothy 4 7, as a matter of fact, because it it's it's it emphasizes it twice in the verse 7 and verse 8 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. <clears throat> now wait till you get there.
Let's get a running start. First Timothy chapter four, verse six, it says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nursed up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' tales, and exercise, listen to that word, exercise thyself in Gold's Gym? No. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Godliness must be exercised. It's like a muscle. If you're not exercising your godly muscle, guess what you're going to be behaving as? Ungodly. You won't be uh, cleansing yourselves from the sins of the flesh and of the spirit, the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. You have to exercise yourself unto godliness. Again, verse 7, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 7 says, refuse feign and, uh, profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness, and he says, exercise yourself unto godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. Godliness is a muscle. The Bible talks about it in, I believe, the first Timothy, uh, in the first Peter or second Peter. It talks about after you believed and your faith is reckoned for righteousness, you add into your faith virtue, add into your virtue knowledge, add into your knowledge temperance, which means self control, <clears throat> add into your self control patience, add into your patience godliness. Add into your godliness, brotherly kindness, and add into your brotherly kindness, charity. Why does godliness have to be added? All these things are your muscle groups. Add into your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temper, temperance, patience, patience, godliness has got to be added to you. Why? Because you're not, because when you're born again, the mystery of your godliness when you were born again is Christ in you. But can I see that Christ is in you? No. Christ is in a whole lot of people, but they act like a booger. They act like they don't know Christ. They act like you can have a Christian curse somebody out stronger than somebody in the world. You can have people in the world behave themselves in a godly manner and have not God in them. Why is that? That's just human nature. The flesh lusts against the spirit. I'm just as good as you are. Good means God, okay? You ask, you ask people, I don't believe there's a God. Yes, you do, because you believe there's good. God's name means good. Do you believe in God? I don't believe in God. Do you believe in good? Oh, yeah, I believe in good. Uh, that's what God's name means. If you don't believe in, uh, if you don't believe in God, then you do not believe in good, because that's His definition. He says there's none good but me. Okay. Nevertheless, we have got to add these characteristics to ourselves. Add unto your faith virtue, add unto your virtue knowledge, add unto your knowledge, patience and temperance and, and godliness. You got to exercise, not only just add it to yourself, but then exercise yourselves in it. A lot of times as born again believers, we are told what to do in scripture and we don't do it. To him that knows to do good, to do the godly thing and doth it not, to him it has missed the mark, which is sin. You're missing the mark. Now, is sin imputed to you? No. Christ died for it, been paid for, justified freely from it. But God did not save you just to sit on our duffs. He saved us for action and activity in godliness. Okay? We are to arm ourselves with a certain mindset. The Bible tells us to arm ourselves with the mind of Christ. Arm yourself with the helmet of salvation, which means what? You should be hard-headed about the, eternal, the eternality of your salvation, that Jesus Christ is your salvation. You got to put those scriptures in your mind. You have to arm your mind, arm yourself. The mindset, let's look at the scripture that talks about arming your mind. Because if a lot of people walk around, <laughs> imagine going into war and you don't have any arms. Look at the people over there in Gaza right now. <clears throat> they don't have any arms to hit back. First Peter chapter four, verse one. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. 
I'm going to try to find this other scripture too. No, oh, it's going to be right next to him. Following that. Okay. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. It says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mindset. Okay. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Okay? So when you get saved, don't close your Bible up and just walk away. Yeah, you got the fire insurance. Yeah, you got to go to heaven, but it's way more to life than that. Just like if someone says, would you want to be born a dog or you want to be born a human? You say, a human. Okay. They say, okay, you're going to be born a human. And you're happy. And they, you wake up and you're born in Ethiopia. You got flies on your face and it's starving. You're a human. You have to be born a human. Yay. But is that the condition you want to be in? No. You'd much rather be in America. Okay. Same with the born again believer. Just because you've been... Now you have peace with God. Now, the second part of that equation is to have the peace of God. Because you have a lot of born-again believers, after they've received salvation, they never come to church, never darken the door again. They don't believe in prayer. And the Bible says we have an infirmity. What's our infirmity? That we don't know how to pray as we ought. And since we don't know how to pray as we ought, we're not arming ourselves with that, with that lethal weapon against Satan. So he's being very lethal toward us and whipping our heads in this fight of faith. Why? Because we have an infirmity. We don't know how to pray. And what did Christ say? Men ought always to pray and not to do what? Faint. So when someone comes up against you, you have cancer. What do we do? <sighs> Faint. You got this. Faint. Sudden such happened to so your child, faint, faint, faint. Tell you the story. When my son was born uh, at five and a half months gestation, so he needed to be in the womb another uh, two and a half months, uh, or three and a half months for, for, for to, to become a mature child, nine months old, to be born nine months pregnancy. He was born at five and a half months. And we took him home, uh, I guess, when the day he should have been born. He was in the hospital for like three months. And in taking him home, on the car ride, we had all these, uh, I guess, uh, mechanical devices attached to him and probes on his heart and probes on his brain. And uh, it was just too much for him. The ride going home was just too much for him. And he stopped breathing. And all the bells and whistles on that machine to start going crazy. And uh, I was sitting there with the child, and his, his tongue turned black. He's a very dark child. He turned, turned even darker. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I said, oh, we'll pull over. You have the uh, uh, the uh, first aid class of how to save a child's life. Handed him over to her. He's like a rag doll. She took him and put, you know, the life breaths puffs in him and breathe into him and nothing happened. He was just, he's still, turning still black, still turning darker. I'm driving down the street, honking at people. And when you honk at people, to get out the way, because you got because you got a problem, what do they do? They slow down. They slow down. So people start slowing down. I'm like, okay. How's he doing? He's back in the backseat working for him. And it's, it's up, beside, beside me working on him. He's not breathing. He's not breathing. So okay, continue to get the breaths. She said, in the name of Jesus, breathe. And then she put her breath in him, and his eyes popped open. Oof. And I'm like, whoa. She called upon the name of the Lord. Why didn't I do that? Because I fainted. Now, you can be fainting. You pay, a lot of people faint. They never hit the ground. Why? Because their faith is fainting. I'm trying to get to the doctor. 
That's where my help is. Where was her help? He wasn't going to make it to the doctor. Our help comes from the Lord. Those, what does the Bible say? <clears throat> I'm looking to the hills with come my help. My help comes from the Lord. Call upon him. He's a very present help in time of trouble. Okay. When she called upon the Lord, then he was saved from his enemies. That death was all on him, trying to get him. But because his mother had the shield of faith, called upon the name of the Lord, death had to back back up. Because Jesus Christ saw their faith. When he saw their faith, the Bible says, he answered. He saw my unbelief, didn't say a word. Okay? We have a problem with knowing how to pray. Think about the woman who was called uh, the woman of Cana. Now, again, Ham is the father of Cana, a black woman. She was not an Israelite. And she comes out of the woods and approaches Jesus and his disciples and says, Lord, son of David, help me. My daughter is grievously vexed of a devil. What did Jesus, what does the Bible say? Jesus, what was God's response? Was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ means Emmanuel, God in the flesh. What was God's response to her? It is written that he answered her not a word. So this is these are principles that we have got to abide by. The Bible is nothing but a bunch of principles. How do you get your prayer answered? What does she do? This woman's nothing's more closer to a woman than her child. She's coming to the Lord and she's laid it out there for him. Help me. My child is vexed with the devil, my daughter. And what does God do for her? He answered her not a word. Now, if you're looking at somebody in the face and you ask them a direct question and they keep on moving like you haven't said a word, wouldn't that offend you? This is our... We don't have the kind of faith this woman <laughs> had. What did Jesus Christ say at the end of this? Great, I've not seen this kind of faith in Israel. Because, and now that we are spiritual Israel, the Bible says that the stuff that's in the Old Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I know people preach from those, but those are the Old Testament books. Why? Because the New Testament begins at the resurrection. That's when the testator died. That New Testament was not in force when Christ was down here. The Old Testament was still in force. So what did Jesus Christ do for this woman who was not an Israelite? He ignored her. What the Bible said that she did. That's the first principle. She took her situation to the Lord. And even in, despite the lack of answer for prayer, a lot of us have been praying for things and God has answered us, not a word. A lot of us went home, got angry, the situation did not fall out the way we wanted to. Got mad at God. He's looking at your response. He does not respond to nothing but faith. He does not respond to need. My son was in need. He did not respond to the need. He responds to what? Faith. My wife prayed the prayer of faith. Lord, save him. In the name of Jesus, breathe. Told him what to do. Told the baby what to, in the name of Jesus, breathe. Didn't even tell the Lord. There are certain things that you've got to exercise yourself to. There are certain things that I can't teach you. There are certain things the Bible can't teach you. What did the Bible say about itself in John? The Holy Spirit says, I have many things in the pen of John. I have many things to say unto you that I will not write down with pen, with pen and ink, with pen and paper, okay? The Holy Spirit is greater than your Bible. You've got to develop a relationship with God. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Listen to what it says. Who has to do the going first? God does not change. You have got to draw nigh unto him. He's not going to bogart his way in you. Where was God when this? Where was God was this? Where was God was this? Well, where were you? People always, where was God? Where was God when that happened? Where was God 9-11? Where were you last week on Sunday during church time? As the same person. 
They ain't got no problem with what they get, what they should be doing. They want to talk about God because in America, we have our roles reversed. We don't treat God like God because in the American mindset, in the, listen closely, in the Christian church, God is not God. God is a genie that we tell him what to do. God bless his food. God do this. God go do this. God help her. God do this. But what did the Bible say about this woman? When after Jesus Christ answered her not a word, he said she drew nigh unto him and worshiped. Wait a minute. This guy looked you dead in your face, didn't say nothing, stepped aside, went on about his business. And what did she do? She drew nigh, got in front of his face again and worshiped him and said, Lord, heal my daughter. She's grievously vexed of a devil. Second time. Then Jesus Christ attacks her nationality. It's not right for me to give the children's bread to dogs. What? That's her gender. It's not right for me to give the children's bread to dogs. Wait a minute. Did this man just call me a dog? What was what was her posture? I'm gonna change religions. I ain't no believing you. Forget you. I ain't the, 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 it's a black woman. Woman of Cana, Ham's the father of Cana, black woman. Big difference between us nowadays that got rights in this Laodicean church age. How dare you? I gotta take this. Take your dog, take my tithe and go home. All the churchianity we got going on. But when you have a situation in your life that means more to you than your pride, you will humble yourself before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and do what he says. He gives her another roadblock. Let's turn over there to that woman of Cana. Answered her not a word. But that was a very, very, very telling story. Matthew chapter 15, verse 23. I'm beginning Matthew 15, 22. Matthew 15, 22. And it says, and behold, a woman of Cana came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But, verse 23, he answered her not a word. And his, and his disciples, born-again Christians, for you and I, came and begged him, besought him, saying, send her away. Wait a minute. This woman comes out beseeching the mercy of God. What she said, did what she say? Give us a dollar. Give me some money. No. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And what did church folks say? Send her away. She cries after us. Okay? The Lord has given you a picture of how your church is going to react when you get in situations. Okay? Situations break, devil breaks loose in your family. How is the church going to respond? Are they going to get down and let's get a prayer group going? Let's get some fasting and prayer going on here and lay hands and... They're going to do what? Send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So what does he attack right there? You're not of my nation. You're not of my nationality. 
You're a woman of Cana. You're a Hamite. As a matter of fact, Canaanites are cursed. Verse 25. Then came she and did what? If you want somebody, if you want something from the Lord, the Bible says God seeks such to worship him. You want the Lord seeking you. Who is he seeking? Those who worship him in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> she came and she did what? She worshiped him. How did she worship him? By saying, Lord, help me. Okay. So he looks up on her. But he answered and said, it is not meat or not right to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Wait a minute. He just attacked her nationality. Now he's talking to her gender role. She's a female. He calls her a dog. Did she get, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to change my religion. I'm not going to hear this. I'm not, I can't take this from you. What did she say that? True, Lord. True. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Why did Jesus Christ at that time answer her prayer? Nothing changed. Okay. First, he answered her not a word. Second, he talked about, uh, I'm only sent to the Israelites, not to Gentiles. Uh, then, it's not right for me to give children of Israel's bread to a dog like yourself. Dogs, plural, you and your daughter. Okay? And she said, oh, truth, Lord. But yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So what did she do? <clears throat> if my people, she's not even his people, called by his name. She wasn't called by his name. She's calling him David, son of David. You got it going on. I know who you are. Humble themselves. Pray. Turn from their, what kind of ways? Wicked ways. Why wasn't she going to Baal? The Canaanites serve the god Baal in Baalism. It's where we get the word Cana Baalism. Okay. They offered up their children's sacrifices to the god Molech. Okay. In the land of Israel. Why well, wouldn't she go in there? She had turned from her wicked ways and went and found the Lord. And the Bible says, a righteous man regards the life of his beast. Do you hear what the scripture says to you? What's it saying here? A righteous man regards the life of his beast. Proverb. So, he says, it's not right for me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs, beasts. What did she say? True, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master. In other words, you're my master. I'm the dog. I'll be that. But you're my master. And the Bible states that a righteous man regards the life of his beast. Verse 28, Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy what? Faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What did this woman teach us, teach us in prayer? That when you don't get an answer from God, get an attitude, God, he kept his eye on her attitude the entire time. And he makes it, the Bible says, God says, I make peace. I create evil. The circumstance in your life, he is orchestrating it. Because guess what? All these down here, as I tell the church all the time, nothing but props. You see people in your life, they're nothing but props. You see relatives acting weird, nothing but props. How are you going to treat them? Because that's Jesus. How are you going to treat them? You're going to treat them according to the flesh, how you feel? Because you read what you sow. 
Oh my goodness. Nevertheless, you got to bring, bend yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, <laughs> perfecting holiness in the fear of God, growing in that, okay? Growing in godliness. How did, what is godliness? The word, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, so by you obeying the word, you are being godly, godlike, okay? The Bible tells us that we are to submit ourselves unto one another in love. That's what the godly thing to do. Now, human nature does not want to submit itself to anybody, anything. We get out of our parents' house, you ain't my mama, you ain't my daddy's the first things out of our house, our mouths in college, you hear that so much time. I'll have my mom and daddy at the house, blah, 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 blah. In this world, you're going to always have somebody over you, okay? When the United States, you got the president, you got your government, you got, you got, you're always going to have one under authority. When another man wanted his child healed, he says, hey, Lord, just speak the word only. I'm a man under authority. I say this to this man, he goes, and I tell this man, come, he comes. And I know that you speak the word, my child will be healed. Okay? We are under the authority of the word of God. When the Bible tells us to perfect our holiness in the fear of God. So we have to understand what the fear of the Lord is. So if you will turn to Proverbs chapter 8. Yes, in Christ Jesus, we've been made as holy as the Holy Spirit in Christ. But while we are in this world, absent from the body, absent from <clears throat> the Lord, but present in this body, the Bible tells us uh, what the fear of the Lord is. If you turn to Proverbs chapter 8, beginning in verse 13. Perfect verse. Proverbs 8.13, the Bible tells us to, to uh, cleanse ourselves, flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. This is discipleship. How do you, what's the fear of the Lord? Oh, glad you asked. Proverbs 8.13 states, the fear of the Lord is to hate, what's that word? Evil. Hate evil, yes. Hate evil. What thing do you have about you that is evil? Well, I'm washing the blood. I'm cleansed with Christ, 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 one. I'm, I'm this, I'm that. I'm righteous God in Christ Jesus. I, 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 hate evil. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible says, beware lest there be in any of you born again believers an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What kind of a heart? An evil heart of murder. We, we would be horrified. An evil heart of adultery. Oh my God. Get the rope. An evil heart of stealing with church offerings. Oh, shoot him. None of that. An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Okay? Where can that evil heart be? Right in your bosom. Again, the Bible tells us that we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we live our lives according to the dictates of our flesh, after how we feel, what we think, we will not have the peace of God. The Bible tells us that when we are born again, the Holy Spirit baptized us into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. You were all baptized into the body. By one spirit were you all baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ, not a body of water, okay? Once you're in Christ, you're in a sinless environment. And now people say, now, 
<clears throat> you got to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Holy, you got the baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When he took your soul, baptized you into the body of Christ. That's the one baptism that God recognizes. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's the one baptism that he recognizes. Now, you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, okay? Now, you're in Christ. You just got saved. You don't know any scriptures. Christ is in you. Holy Spirit's in you. God is in you. And the Bible tells you now you should become a disciple. Now, a baby doesn't know that he needs to change his diaper. A baby doesn't know it needs to warm a bottle for itself. A baby doesn't know it needs to do this and this. So we, as born-again believers, have to take authority over those who are babes in Christ. We got to get them to come to the church. Got to get them to hear the word of the Lord. We got to put these things in them. We got to put these roadblocks in them so they won't be uh, uh, emissaries of Satan, ambassadors for Satan, because they still have a carnal mind. The mind is not being renewed when you get saved, okay? We got to let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Take out the old thoughts, put in the new thoughts. Don't do things this way. Do things this way. Get rid of that evil heart of unbelief, and that's our trusting in the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Second thing is to hate pride, to hate arrogancy, to hate the evil way. What's the evil way? Your way. What's the evil way? My way. To hate the forward mouth. What's the forward mouth? Your mouth. When it's not speaking the word of God, when it's backbiting, when it's going back gossiping, when it's tail bearing, when it's doing everything with it, with it, myriads of things. In the forward mouth do I, the Lord God, hate. So this is how you cleanse yourself from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit? Yes, by hating evil, getting rid of it, hating pride, get rid of it, arrogancy, your evil ways. What did the Bible say? If my people call by my name, humble themselves. Because why? Be in pride. Turn from their what? Evil ways, wicked ways. The devil's people? No. People are saved to the uttermost. God has cleansed you from all sin. Now he tells you, you got work to do. You got to cleanse yourself. But I'm not going to do the rest up for it. You got to put on godliness. You got to put on the armor. You got to. You got work to do. They ain't just sitting around claiming the promises. People do that. Again, we are all, with every heartbeat, drawing closer and closer to that grave. Once we hit, hit that grave, after death is the judgment. That's when you and I, after the millennial age, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things we've done in this body, whether they are good, whether they are evil. And each will be rewarded. Every, every recompense, the Bible says it in the book of Romans, chapter two, tribulation, anguish. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Romans chapter two, tribulation, anguish. Romans 2 9. It says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. To the Jew first, those in covenant with God, because in this book here, the last two verses tells you, he says, the Jew is those who are born again believers and also to the Gentile, okay? But glory, honor, and peace to every soul that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentiles. So you're gonna be rewarded for your good, you're gonna be rewarded for your evil, okay? What's gonna be for your evil? Tribulation, wrath, to every soul of man that doeth evil. What's the rest of it? For the good you do, glory, honor, and peace. The Bible says, after the judgment seat, what's the Bible says God's going to be doing? He's going to be wiping away tears from our eyes. I asked my wife, I said, those tears of joy? He says, nobody wipes away tears of joy. Okay? It's like when daddy 
come home and did you do your chores? Uh, no. Is the issue he's going to banish you and kick you out of the house and take away your inheritance and take you out the wheel? No. But there's going to be some correction going on, okay? There's going to be some correction. The Bible tells us, let's look in, uh, I think it was 1 Corinthians. Turn over to 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 3. It said, done in body. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear where? Before, not the great white throne judgment, that's for the sinner who does not know God. He'll have to give account for all of his bad deeds and all of his bad words and everything else. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or, what's that last word? Bad. You're going to receive for the bad you've done? Yes. Yes. I thought our sins were forgiven. They're forgiven. Your works are now judged. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, for their works do follow them. Again, it talks about how that day will declare it. Your works will be brought forth, and it will be tried by fire. If any man's work survive the fire, you shall receive a reward. If any man's work be burned, you will suffer the loss. Suffer loss, I looked that word up when I was a little kid, <laughs> a teenager. It says to receive damage, okay? What kind of damage? We don't know. But the Bible talks about, therefore, knowing, knowing the terror of the Lord. We don't preach the fear of the Lord because we don't have fear before God because God in this Laodicean church age is respecting my rights. I got a right to ask him this. I got a right for this. I got this and this and this. You approach God. He sits on a mercy seat. He owes you nothing. He owes you absolutely nothing. Everything you're getting from God is based upon his graciousness, his benevolence toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when we get anything from the Lord, we should be like that, that woman. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like a little dog just trying to trying to please his master, his master. Why? Because we don't do, we're not in his league. We're not in his league. The Bible, well, there's this guy the other day said, the Bible says that God says, I create good. And I create evil. I, the Lord, do these things. And the guy was, got on my page and started saying, God doesn't create moral evil. That would be against his character. No, 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 no. He's the same. He says, I create evil. I make peace. I create evil. So if any, that's why the Bible tells you not to resist evil. Who's in charge of all evil? Who's the, who's the creator of it? Satan is. No, get that. Get this Disney out of your mind and go back to, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Well, God cannot create evil. He created you, didn't he? Did he create you? What did Jesus Christ say? You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. So if God created you, he created evil. That should shut the mouths right there. That shuts their mouths. Why? Because the natural mind is too intelligent to believe God's word. Because God is meek and lowly in heart. He says, come unto me, all ye that are laboring and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We go, ah, that doesn't work. 
So we go out there and slug it out like Samson. Samson was a man that every decision he made was wrong. He was in covenant with God. He was in charge of the people of God. He had an office over the people of God as their leader, their judge. But what was he doing? Sleeping with the harlots. What was he doing? <laughs> the Bible tells him not to, not to uh, drink any wine, not to take anything or the fruit of the vine. But you find him going through the Valley of Sorek. What is that valley? A valley of grapes. Why are you even going near? The Bible talks about certain things you don't even go near. Pass not by it. Go not near it. Step away. Okay? He's playing with it. Then pretty soon he's revealing the secrets of his power to that which was his enemy. Okay? Every decision he made was always wrong. Every last one. Is he saved? Yes. He's in the Hall of Fame of Faith. But did he fulfill God? Did he cleanse himself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit? No. Did he perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord? No. Did all Israel call upon the Lord because of his great example? No. He is a man symbolized that this is the kind of Christian you can be. A Christian, you're going to go to heaven, but you made poor decisions. How did he end up dying? A blind bachelor. First thing in his first thing comes out of Samson's mouth when he's introducing the scripture is, I saw, he saw, I saw a woman. Go get her for me. How did he end up dying? By a woman. The Bible says, give not thy strength unto women nor into a way that destroys kings. What did he do? He's always had to have a woman. He had to have a woman. He had to have a woman. He had to have a woman. Had to have a woman. Had to... Never sought the Lord. All we find him is giving one prayer at the very end of his life. He makes a deathbed confession. I mean, do something for the Lord, da, 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 and dies and kills more people in his life than he did in his death. Uh, the Philistines. And that's it. Did he fulfill God's purpose? No. At the end of the book, the whole book of Judges is that every man did what was right in his own eyes. So the Bible tells us to do what? We got to come out of this self-grandizement. It's about me. It's about my rights. It's about how I feel. The Bible says, bunk on how you feel. Bunk on your rights. Ye are dead. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Jesus Christ said, uh, get it out of your mind if you think you're going to become a disciple because unless you deny yourself, you cannot be my disciple. So tonight's word is, choose you this day who you're going to serve. If Baal's God, if the world is God, if all that's God, then follow it. Still going to go to heaven. But if the Lord be God, if the Lord is your God, follow him. What did Joshua say? But as for me in my house, we're going to do what? Serve the Lord. You got to draw a line in the sand. Because right now, we're right before the church age is going to become persecuted. Persecuted. For you being a Christian, persecuted. We've never had that in America. Give it about 10, 15 years. When we got into the political process, that's going to that brought us into the, the, fr the fray. Okay? So now we're looking at, oh, you've taken away our gay rights. You've taken away our abortion rights. You're taking away our drinking rights. You're taking away, you're taking away, it's because these Christians. Kill them, string them up. That doesn't take much. Doesn't take much. Didn't take much for lynchings. The natural man can justify anything. It crucified Jesus. You're not going to produce a greater case than him. So what should you do? Seek the Lord. What the Bible say? Second, <clears throat> yeah, in the verse, verse we quoted earlier, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, 
lay aside these things, get rid of the filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is to do what? Heading your pride, put your pride away, humble yourself. Draw nigh unto God, he will do what? Draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your heart, ye what? Double-minded. That's what the majority of Christians are today. I can be a friend with the world, and I can be a disciple. And Jesus says, no, you can't. I'm not having it. What does the Bible say? What did Jesus Christ say? Oh, this guy came into the church, and he prayed with himself. Not played with himself. Prayed with himself thus. Lord, I'm glad I'm not like other men. And God said, which one? God didn't even hear the guy's prayer. The Laodicean church age has Jesus. The church is so corrupt and so packed with their things, their programs, their this, their that, just junk, that Jesus is on the outside knocking to get in. Don't let that be your life. Don't let that be your life. Well, it's 8 o'clock, 8.01. Started at 701, so we can open up the uh, mics and ask questions. If they go on tonight. Good evening, Pastor. How you doing, my brother? How you doing, Pastor Mike? All right, all right, all right. Oh, man, good word tonight. This word, <laughs> yeah, I'll have to try to uh, put everything together here because I wanted to start here. Now, uh, the mystery of godliness, can you uh, break that down for me again uh, based on, um, let's see, godliness is a muscle. Uh, then you uh, talked about the muscle groups and exercise yourself in these things. Okay, so now when you say the mystery of godliness, is that word godliness is the same as the uh, prior scriptures uh, thing that I just uh, uh, mentioned about the muscle groups, or is it talking about uh, of how God, of how Christ in God, you know? We'll turn to 1 Timothy 3.16. It's a okay. famous 3.16 verse. 1 Timothy 3.16. First Timothy 3.16 okay. says, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. This is the mystery uh -huh. of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Mm -hmm. Now turn to Colossians 127. Okay, Colossians 127. Okay. Let's look at verse 25. <clears throat> uh, 25. Even the mystery which has been hidden from the ages and generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you Gentiles, which is Christ where? Well, what, where you at now? You said Colossians 1? Uh, Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27. Okay, okay. Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, this is the mystery of your godliness, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Okay. So the mystery of our godliness is Christ in us. Okay. But as we grow in grace, the Bible tells us, let's go over to uh, Peter, where it talks about Ed. <clears throat> uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. 5. 
Okay. Second Peter chapter one, verse five, beginning it says, uh, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, add to your virtue, knowledge, but knowledge puffs up. So you have to add to your knowledge, self-control, which means temperance. Add to your temperance, patience, and add to patience, godliness. Because just because you're born again does not mean you're godly. And add to godliness, brotherly kindness, and add to brotherly kindness, charity. These are the things that build on each other. And then it says in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things, lacks what things? Knowledge, temperance, godliness, patience, brotherly kindness, and charity, is not, not, does not mean they're unsaved. They are blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. But rather, mm -hmm. brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, what things? Add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, temperance patience, patience godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness charity. If you do these things, ye shall never fall. Most people fall from their own step fastness. They get tired of being weary because when you're doing these things, generally you're the only one on that ladder trying to do it. So if, this is not this is not the fall from grace. Is this is, uh, how do you fall from grace? Turn to Galatians 5, 4. Put eyes on that. Okay. Galatians 5, 4. 5, 4. Okay. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So you fall from grace, not by sinning too much. You fall from grace by going under Moses' law, that thou shalt not to be saved. Christ becomes ineffective. The Bible talks about you can fall from grace. <clears throat> you can fail the grace of God, like Esau did. And you can frustrate the grace of God. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, <clears throat> And the promises and the none effect and Christ is dead in vain. Okay. So we have got to avoid the three F's of failing the grace of God, falling from grace, and frustrating the grace of God. We are to grow in grace. And the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness, to deny okay. worldly lust, and how to live soberly, how to live righteously, how to live godliness, godly in this present world. Looking okay, that's uh Jesus Christ. okay. The three F's. What you say now? Failing of the grace of God. Failing. Frustrating. Frustrating. Galatians two twenty, and uh, falling. Galatians five four. Galatians five four, and then the, the first one was Galatians two twenty. Um, failing is uh, no uh, Galatians five four is falling from grace. 220 is frustrating grace. And uh, what the Bible talks about, Cain, how he failed the grace of God, F-A-I-L, grace. That's in Hebrews chapter 5, verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, when you fail of the grace of God. The Bible says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and many be defiled. Having bitter bitterness in your hearts in the brotherhood of the Lord. That's how you feel the grace of God. Okay. Okay. All right. So I found a scripture uh, in the book of Hebrews and it was concerning um about Christ being our mediator mm -hmm. forever. 
So he's mediating. Um, he's mediating for us, even though uh, if, if if we're not adding to our faith, if we're not uh, perfecting godliness and all of this, right? If we're not doing none of these things, he's still mediating for us on the grounds of what? Our faith in him and that God put us in him? No, on the new covenant. Uh, Hebrews 8, 6, it says, but now he hath attained a, ex a more excellent ministry by, for he is a mediator of a better covenant, which is established uh -huh. upon better promises. So he's given, he's a mediator of the, the promises. <clears throat> After you die, your, your estate goes into probate. And then somebody has got to be the administrator or the mediator of your last will and testament, your covenant. So after he died, he rose from the dead, and he's now the mediator of the covenant. He goes in that, opens up the new covenant, and says, this is what they get. They get to be as holy as the Holy Spirit. They get to be covered in my righteousness. They get to become the bride of Christ. They get to be uh, uh, holy as the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, God is a God that's just. There was a guy named LaGuardia. Uh, when you go to... New York City is LaGuardia Airport. He was Mayor LaGuardia. He used to be a judge, and he was a judge during the uh, Depression. And some guy broke in to some store and stole some food, and uh, they brought him up on charges. He was stealing for his food so he could feed his family. And Mayor LaGuardia had to hear the case. And the guy said, "You did you break in? He said, yes, I did. Why'd you break in? I didn't have any money. I need to feed my family. They're starving. So you stole? Yes. So LaGuardia said, well, you're guilty. And the prosecutor said, that's the law. He's guilty. Throw the book at him. He's guilty. And the and the, the crime is is has been done. Uh, he's got to pay. And the, the problem is, is he has no money to pay. But you are found guilty, and your penalty is twenty dollars. So twenty dollars back in the depression is equivalent of two hundred dollars today. And the guy had no money anyway. So Mayor Laguardia gets up from the bench and goes and pays the twenty dollars and satisfies the judgment. And then he comes back and he says, "Everybody in the courtroom, pass the hat." And everybody put money in the hat, and they gave the man some money, and he walks out. Made Laguardia you know, very famous in New York City. And then he fined the city for not having the conditions so that a man could go and get a job, okay? So this man was guilty. LaGuardia did what? He paid the penalty for the man, then stuffed the man's pockets full of money and sent him on his way. That's what God did to us. We were guilty, okay, in Adam. Didn't have a prophet, priest, or king, had no God decided to do what? Send his son to pay the penalty for us. And then he gives us a new covenant. By this new covenant, I'm going to make you a child of God, you piece of dirt, you piece of dust. I'm going to make you a child of God. I'm going to put the spirit of God in you. I'm going to call you by Christ's name. I'm going to put the spirit of Christ in you. And I'm going to make you my bride. I'm going to consummate our marriage. We're going to be one together. For it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. I'm going to make you my bride. You're going to rule and reign with me forever. So Christ is still getting the administrated, the new covenant established upon better promises. Uh, verse, uh, so this, again, it says in Hebrews 8, 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. And then it says in uh, Hebrews 9, 15, for this cause, he is a mediator of the new covenant that by means of death, the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And then it says in Hebrews 12, uh, 24, to Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant and of the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So he's giving us all these exceeding benefits packages. He's just giving you all the benefits that's coming out. So we're sitting saying before the Lord, 
uh, the Bible talks about he makes intercession for the transgressors. We're still breaking the law. And Satan is still accusing us before the Lord day and night. But the Bible states that when Satan accuses us, Jesus says, I died for that. That's why this, I have this wound. I was wounded for that transgression. I was bruised on my back for that iniquity. I was chastised so that they can have peace. And by my stripes, they're healed. So he's just up there being our attorney, our attorney at law. He's our advocate. That's what the word means. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have a lawyer with the Father. And what's he doing? He's meeting the new covenant says that blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sin. So even though he's sinning, the Lord will not count it against him. Who is that man? Those who are not under the law, but have accepted Christ's sacrificial, gracious gift of salvation by grace through faith in his death, blood, and resurrection to redeem us from all unrighteousness. How do you get saved? By believing that Christ died for your sins and God raised him from the dead after he paid the penalty for your sins to give you eternal life if you accept him as the payment for your sins. Do you believe that Christ died for your sins and rose again and only on that basis you have eternal life? If your answer is yes, then you've been given the free gift of eternal salvation. The spirit is now inside of you. Can you feel it? No. You might feel the relief of, whew, he died for all my sins, past, present, and future. He died, died 2,000 years ago. So he had to cover future sins. Or you have to die after you die. That ain't going to happen. He died once to put away the sin of the world by the sacrifice of himself. And after he died, the Bible said he sat down on the right hand of the Father, making the intercession for you. So, so the devil, the devil knowing this, Mm -hmm. Knowing this, and he still yes. comes before God, accusing us? Yes. He's accused of the brethren. Let me get the verse for you. Accuser. Accuser. Let's see here. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So right now, he's up there. Mike had this thought. Mike said this. Dave did this. <laughs> Artie did this. Bobby did this. That did this. Day and night. And Christ is right there, batting it all away. Uh, the, in, in our court system, because of the Bible, we have this thing called double jeopardy. You cannot try the person for the same crime twice. Amen. What what do I, and this is my last thing, where do I find the uh uh, the uh, the judge in New York. How do I read about that? LaGuardia? Yeah, uh, how you spell that? Uh, uh, let me see that. <clears throat> put down New York Airport, New York. Uh, let's see here. There's Kennedy Airport. It used to be called LaGuardia. Maybe they changed the name of it. We say Mayor LaGuardia. LaGuardia. Oh, there he is. His first name is Ferrello, F I O R E L L O. Mm -hmm. and his last name is L A Guardia, G U A R D, like guard, then I A. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, that's, he was the 99th mayor of New York City. Very charismatic personality. Okay. Now I'll find his story under his uh, biography or something. Oh, um, <clears throat> it's all, uh, 
I, I don't know where you can find the story, but uh, that's a very powerful story. Oh yeah, but he he did it. He was a unusual man, a very unusual man. All right. Amen, brother. Well, any other questions? Reggie, you got anything to add tonight? No. Let's see. Artie, you want to let us out in prayer? There we go. <laughs> I was having problems getting it off mute. Oh, yeah, no problem. Father God, thank you for the word we received tonight, Lord. Father, we thank you for all of our blessings. We thank you for your grace and mercy and that you were watching over us in this season <clears throat> of our lives. Thank you for your word and thank you for the blood. And please watch over us for the rest of this week. Actually watch over us for the rest of our lives. Amen. 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 Mm. Well, God bless you guys. Thank right. you. Take care. God bless. God bless.